Let me take this opportunity to thank the Employment Equity Chairperson, Ms. Nkabinde, and her fellow commissioners for preparing this report so that we can all take stock of progress we are making and identify the root causes of those areas that remain problematic. It's been the 12 months since the, the release of the last report, which as expected generated a robust debate of all kinds. I hope this one will equally trigger the same levels of robustness in the national discourse. But I also want to clarify the issue of a report because in certain corners some people think that we just sit down and come up with this report. The report is submitted by the CEO of the company or the Director General of the Department, whoever has submitted. We know that there are still those who continue to be critical of the continued existence of employment equity policies, even labeling it apartheid or racism in reverse. We also acknowledge those who are calling on the ANC government to strengthen the existing employment equity law. After reading this report, I have no doubt that they will find even more reasons why we still need this instrument. We challenge those who believe that the employment equity and affirmative action policies have gone past their sell by date to read the, this commission's report carefully and check if, in all honesty, it is really time to scrap employment equity and affirmative action. Do they truly believe that we have achieved what the Act was set, to, was set out to do? If in doubt on how to respond to this question, reading this report will help them to understand that they are called to scrap affirmative action and this Act is upset and premature at best. Let us recall that introducing employment equity was for all intents and purposes a recognition that South Africa comes from an ugly past where discrimination was the cornerstone of social and economic engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, the aims and objectives of the Employment Equity Act have not changed from giving expression to the, to the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, the Freedom Charter of 1955, the ILO Convention Number 111 of 1958, Section 9 of the South African Bill of Rights of 1996, and most recently, the 2009 and 2014 ANC election manifestos. The 2014 ANC election manifesto specifically called on us to, and I quote, take steps to strengthen existing laws to ensure faster change in employment equity in all workplaces by enforcing and accelerated implementation of employment equity targets, close quotes. We have indeed strengthened, strengthened the existing labor laws and the amendments to the Employment Equity Act were signed into law recently. It is too early to see if all this is giving us the desired outcomes. However, we take solace that already there are signs of improvements, albeit small at this stage. The employment equity remains the only instrument to redress fundamental labor market inequities and to eliminate discrimination on the basis of demographic profile, which is race and gender, as well as disability and HIV status. It is the only show in town, ladies and gentlemen. For this reason, we have no choice, ladies and gentlemen, but to make it work. The employment equity report that is being launched this morning demonstrate in no uncertain terms that what the X seeks to achieve is disappointingly still far from being accomplished. I urge you not to be discouraged by the picture we see in this report, but use it as a source of inspiration to work even harder moving forward. In June 1968, ANC President Oliver Reginald Tambo on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the UN Declaration 
of Universal Human Rights said, and I quote, the antagonism of the South African racist regime towards the Declaration of Human Rights is not based on any complicated ideas derived from political philosophy or ideology. The simple fact is that for every section of the Declaration, the statute law of South Africa has a provision which contains a direct and express infringement. South Africa has the distinction of being the only country in the world which boldly and ashamedly acts in contravention of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as part of its avowed policy. Africans do not have the right to a job and in fact are legally prevented from doing a large variety of jobs which are reserved for whites. Our people do not have the right to equal opportunity in all fields of life. Without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political, or other opinion, close quote. Way before the National Party came into power in 1948, Arthur Keppel Jones was once quoted by ANC President Oliver Tambo, <coughs> as having said, and I quote, the salvation of the country can only lie in the reversal of historic tendencies as a reversal so thorough as to constitute a revolution, close quote. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly the basis for the employment equity, salvation of the country and reversal of historic tendencies. Whilst it may as yet reach its revolution status, but it might quickly assume that character considering what we are pondering to do in the immediate future. I will briefly touch on that before concluding my remarks that President O.R. Tambo will be pleased to know that the ANC government has responded to the concerns he raised back in 1968. We have put in place policies that deal with directly with these issues and we already see progress on all fronts. We may not be where we want to be yet, but marching on is what we will continue to do. Chaperson and your fellow commissioners, your overview demonstrates clearly that whilst we have some progress, there is still a long way to go as there are many who are still beholden to outdated historic tendencies. I believe it will be very incorrect to say that we have overcome the historic tendencies that Ada Campbell Jones raised many years ago and what ANC President O.R. Tambo said in 1968. But are we doing something about it? I can say yes, we are. Based on your analysis, it is also clear that our journey to achieve the ideals and captured in the United Nations Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, the Freedom Charter of 1955, the ILO Convention No. 111 of 1958, Section 9 of the South African Bill of Rights of 1996, and most recently, the 2009 and 2014 election manifestos Whilst partially achieved, there is still a lot that remains to be done. I submit, ladies and gentlemen, that it will be a useless to assume that relatively good administrative compliance, which is all I can deduce from the majority of the designated employers' uh, EEE reports, will translate into the impact we need. If a designated employee obtains a promotion but it is stripped of the authority that comes with it. Whilst this may meet the administrative compliance requirements, it will on a grand scale be going against the grain of what is intended by this law. What joy will a designated employee derive from a promotion that is hollow? Therefore, we need to examine carefully those areas where administrative compliance is seen to be relatively good, whether or not these are significant enough in, in, and indeed give us the desired impact. I have also observed the tendency that when there are challenges in achieving our stated objectives, people are quick to blame the law. 
when in most instances, instances it is not the law that is a culprit, but the negative attitudes of those who are supposed to implement the law. Program directors, I must say that the spirit and the latter of our Employment Equity Act ticks all the right boxes and it enjoys international recognition as being among the best in the world. The trouble seems to lie with the, the low levels of compliance. Whilst the general tendency is to blame the employers for non-compliance, I strongly believe that there are instances where workers unwittingly add to this problem through complacency. There have been cases where some workers seem to have no clue about the content of employment equity plans and reports that are submitted by their employers to the department. This raises fundamental questions such as one, do workers really co-craft these plans and co-sign the final reports before they are submitted to the department? Two, do workers' representatives monitor compliance by their respective employers if so, to what extent are they taking full advantage of the recently introduced amendments? Chairperson, I call on workers to be vigilant by ensuring that they truly scrutinize the equity plans and reports before being submitted to the department. Workers must be extra eyes and ears of our inspectorate and the commission and report things that appear to be violations. Workers need to understand the implications of not making time and effort to ensure that nothing about them without them is allowed to go unchecked. On other hand, the designated employers must understand that the Commission and our inspectorate are not only there to enforce legislation, but they are also there to assist those designated employers that need assistance in order to comply. This does not apply to those who choose to hide with the hope that they will not be caught out. Let it also be known that repeat offenders and those who choose not to seek help in order to comply will not be spared. Another source of grave concern from where I sit is that the ILO or social partners, that is business, labor and government will agree on what constitute international best practice but when we get back home some of them behave as if it is the first time they come across what needs to be done it is also hard to believe that social partners will agree at netlag on what must be incorporated in the legislation but do very likely to walk the talk thereafter for example, we have all agreed at the ILO to promote equal opportunities for women and men in pursuit of decent work, which simply means fairly paid productive work carried out in conditions of freedom, equity, security, and human dignity. Yet there is very little evidence that these are being pursued with agency. Let me once again take this opportunity to thank the chairperson and her fellow commissioners for their work and the effort that has gone into compiling this analytic report. Your data analysis leaves the critical areas that require urgent attention and as such we will not be shooting in the dark, proverbially speaking, in our endeavors to find solution. I must point out, however, that the report once again points the painfully slow pace <coughs> of transformation in South Africa labor market and black people, women and persons with disabilities remain underrepresented in all aspects of the Employment Equity Act. It also mirrors what seems to be a glaring lack of appetite for transformation. It is concerning that there are just too many JSE listed companies that are completely ignoring the law. It is this state of affairs that leaves us no option but to consider drafting in harsher consequences for non-compliance. It's time to up the ante, and this may include promulgating the stick and or punitive sections and chapters of the Employment Equity Act, which were initially excluded from promulgation. 
This will give the act real teeth and will bite where it hurts the most, and that is designated employer's revenue. And I'm raising this chairperson based also on what uh, you have advised me on. And we have started the process as the department, including the African National Congress, because I have informed them that as the department, we are going to promulgate Section 53 in line with Chapter 2 and Chapter 3. Precisely because uh, designated employers, it's easier to budget for paying the fines rather than to implement the Employment Equity Act. And as the department, we have already started the discussions with the Department of Treasury and also the South African Revenue Services. So that when it comes to the issuing of certificates, compliance certificates, we will be able to say these are the companies that are not complying and therefore they should not get the work from the government. And we have been saying if the companies are not complying, we are going to come up with a decision on how we have to deal with those issues. And now is the time to act on that one. Ladies and gentlemen, our enforcement and compliance section have issued more than 6 million employment equity fines to non-complying JSE listed companies. And I was informed that there are more than 192 companies uh, that were involved, but the DDG on inspection and enforcement that we call her uh, the Inspector General, Ms. Moila, will further give the full details on how much have we fined certain companies who have paid, who have not yet paid. Whilst we can claim with pride that most of what ANC President Oliver Reginald Tambo grieved on in 1968 have been achieved, today through the Employment Equity Act, our people do have the right to equal opportunity uh, in the workplace without distinction of any kind such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political, or other opinion. All that is remaining is to translate these rights into something that our people can experience and feel on a daily basis. And I must say, also during the CSW uh, conference, it's only South Africa that has a legislation deals with the, with the employment equity which also include the equal work for the work of the equal value. There is no other country in the world that have that legislation. And I think we have to pride ourselves as South Africa, but as employers, we need to honor what we have signed as part of the ILO Convention. We know that this will require all of us to pull together and the Department of Labor to make extra effort to ramp up enforcement. Once again, let me point out that given the magnitude of the challenge at hand, there is no way that government can undertake this journey all by itself. We need the support and unconditional commitment of all our social partners. Some observers believe that South Africans are sometimes too harsh to themselves in terms of the achievements of its young democracy. Others are saying this country has achieved so much in changing the policy landscapes relative to how long the ANC government has been in power. Are we being too harsh to ourselves? You are going to be the judge. The commissioners, to the commissioners, thank you for driving your outreach program in the period under review. The slight improvement in the submission of the reports could as well be attributed to that every effort. I also want to thank the uh, officials of the department by their for, for their support and also further thank the deputy minister for his support because when we work together, we will achieve more. Ladies and gentlemen, I officially launched the 17th Employment Equity Report and accordingly place it in the public domain as a point of reference as we continue in our quest for social justice. And I thank you very much.